Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Welcome to the front row. Uh, my name is Jamie Williamson. I'm a professor here at the Scripps Research Institute and I'm pleased to be your host today for this really interesting lecture by Professor Ahmad Badran. Uh, but before I, I uh, introduce him, I, I'd like to say a few things about the general topic of synthetic biology. So uh, syn synthetic biology broadly defined is just the application of uh, engineering techniques to biological systems to bring out emergent properties in those systems uh, that, that weren't necessarily produced in nature. So at, at, at its core, uh, synthetic biology is really an interdisciplinary study. And, and as you'll see in, in Ahmed's lecture, he brings together lots of different ways of thinking. And, and you can address problems in uh, diverse fields that impact uh, the globe and the human condition. Uh, I think I can go, yeah. Uh, so here, here's just a couple of examples uh, of things that, and this is not work done at Scripps, but just things that have been done in the field. People have used microbial fermentation to make dyes that are, uh, you know, better for the environment and UV protective. Of course, there's all of this uh, synthetic food work going on. Uh, you can engineer uh, protein sources to, to, to make burgers and, and other meats that are uh, environment, more environmentally friendly than growing animals. Uh, and one that we might spend another slide on is this CAR T cell therapy. Uh, so this is it's a cancer therapy where you take uh, uh, lymphocytes out of people's blood, and then you re-engineer them to attack the cancer cells. And, and this is a, a big problem that's actually being uh, tackled here at Scripps in the caliber division. Uh, and one of the challenges in CAR T cell therapy is that after these T cells get done attacking the cancer cells, if they're all gone, then they just look for something else and you can actually have a toxic reaction to, to, T, to, to the CAR T cell therapy and that's limited its applicability. And what Caliber has done is engineer in a switch so you can turn the, uh, the T cells off. So they still attack cancer cells, but then you can switch them off later. And if there's an adverse effect, uh, you, you can just turn the cells off. So uh, the clinical trials are going really well and uh, people are actually responding uh, to this therapy. Uh, so we have a, a few other people working on things. Uh, so we just hired an assistant professor, Yu Zong, uh, and she's uh, just arrived on campus and is going to be using synthetic biology uh, to make improved vaccines and uh, medications. Uh, our president, Peter Schultz, uses synthetic biology, and he's trying to uh, engineer some organisms uh, to have uh, you know, properties that were similar to prebi prebiotic conditions. Uh, and today, we're uh, getting to Ahmed Badran. So he's a, a noted synthetic biologist, uh, and he's using this to attack all kinds of things, but today we're gonna talk about greenhouse gases and climate change. Now, so let me tell you a little bit before I introduce Ahmed what, what we're gonna do. Uh, so we're really pleased to have everybody. This is our second lecture of the season uh, and our second lecture in this new hybrid format. So for those of you uh, in the ether, uh, welcome, and it's glad to have you joining us virtually. We, we've got about 75 people here, it looks like, that are in person. So we'd encourage you to come and, and see, then you can uh, mingle with scientists and the speakers uh, and have a little chat after the, uh, after the lecture. And so, so please come to campus, we'd love to invite you, but we also uh, welcome you to join virtually. So that's great. Uh, at the end of Ahmed's lecture, I'll come up and we'll sit and we'll have a little uh, discussion. And there's two ways the people in the audience can raise their hand and someone will come to you with a microphone. And people in the virtual audience, uh, you can type uh, your questions at any time during the lecture during the Q&A, either in the Q&A or chat on the Zoom app. And uh, we will try to get, we will get those to me. I have a, a handy iPad that I will get relayed questions and that, and. I will lead the discussion with Ahmed. Uh, I'm sure uh, it'll be an interesting discussion. It's a great topic. So I'm gonna let Ahmed introduce himself 
uh, and his personal history and how he came to Scripps and uh, came to work on, on climate change. Uh, but the title of his talk is Reengineering a Sustainable Word. Please welcome Ahmed Badra. Thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. Uh, it's an immense pleasure to be here today uh, to tell you a little bit about some of the things that have really driven the work that my lab is doing here at Scripps. Um, so just to echo what Jamie had said, um, to everyone here today, I welcome you. I hope you'll enjoy today's talk, and to everyone on Zoom, uh, same to you. So um, I also made a different title slide, and maybe this will give it away into the direction that we're going to move in. Um, but I've been interested in this idea for a very long time. Um, I'll explain to you over the course of this lecture why I think we can actually achieve the title of this talk. Um, before that, a little bit about me. I am a world citizen. I've lived in a lot of different places. And the trajectory that my life has taken has colored a large part of how I approach and think about science. Um, I was born uh, many decades ago now uh, in the northern town of uh, Kiel in western Germany. Uh, this was before the fall of the Berlin Wall, so you can kind of tell my age. Um, and uh, I was born in Germany because my parents were studying in the university there. My dad is an astrophysicist and my mother is a botanist. Um, and their work and their passion for science really drove me to pursue a career in science as well. Um, shortly after I was born, we moved to the small town of Tanta in Egypt, and I'm actually an Egyptian national and later naturalized U.S. citizen. Um, and the time that I spent there was really foundational because I was surrounded by agriculture, as you'll see is going to be a focus of this talk. Um, Tanta turns out to be one of the agricultural hubs of Egypt, and so I got to see a lot of that while I was growing up. Later in my life, my family immigrated to the US where uh, at the University of Arizona, I earned my bachelor's degree in a number of fields that you can see have some words that have to do with biology and some with chemistry. And that really highlights the interdisciplinary nature of the research that happens in my lab. Um, after this, I went on to do a PhD in what's called chemical biology. It's really the discipline of using the principles of chemistry to understand and explore biology um, at Harvard University. And then later stayed for couple of extra years in an institute called the Broad Institute, um, trying to explore some of these foundational ideas of synthetic biology and how I could use it to be able to address some of the uh, critical problems that affect the world today. Um, this has now brought me to today, where I am an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at Scripps Research, um, focusing on a lot of different things, as Jamie showed, um, but really, it's on this core idea that we can use principles from chemistry, biology, engineering to really tease apart some of the foundational problems that affect our planet and develop sustainable solutions to addressing them. And the pictures that I've shown you are really how I think about the different parts of my journey and how the environment around me has colored the importance of this problem to me. So to get us all started, I want to put things in perspective. The Earth is warming up. And that simple. These are real numbers. The temperature of the planet, um, or rather the outlier temperature, every year for every month. And what you can see is at around 1940s, the temperature, the outlying temperature of the planet continues to increase. And it peaks sometime in the middle of the summer, usually in July. Um, and you can see that these lines continue to go up higher and higher. And every summer for the past couple of decades has always been the hottest summer on record and 2023 is no different. And so clearly, the temperature of the planet is increasing, and this is having a tremendous impact on our world. It's having this impact in a number of different ways. From a biomedical perspective, the increases in the temperature are actually incentivizing bacteria to become resistant to our frontline antibiotic therapies. This is something that we're also interested in exploring in my lab. But beyond that, maybe you're more familiar with the fact that the increasing temperatures are also melting the ice that's on the poles of our planet. And this in turn is increasing the sea level, which for coastal communities like ours in San Diego can have a pretty detrimental consequence. More practically, as the temperature of the planet continues to increase, drought becomes a problem. And drought is a major issue because it, uh, it will have a dramatic impact on our agricultural industry. And while that might not seem like a huge effect today, 
the current trends show that over the next few decades, especially leading up to 2050, our requirements for water, and in particular food, will have to increase by nearly 70%. So if you imagine that the temperature of the planet is increasing and our ability to grow plants is going away because the planet is warming up, then our ability to actually hit these numbers is going to be very difficult uh, indeed. This is no, no longer a purely global issue. Uh, we all recently felt the impact of Hurricane Hillary uh, just a few weeks ago. And this is, of course, the product of climate change. And in fact, one of the first, or the only time that um, the United States government had, has issued what's called a tropical storm warning in Southern California, um, just to give you a sense of what's happening here. Drought continues to be an issue. So every line that you see here is the drought that's affecting the agriculture in the immediate local environment here in San Diego. And you can see that the intensity and the color increase as we go from left to right in time. And just the temperature. I'm sure you've all felt it going outside of your homes over the, this past summer. The temperature is getting hotter, and we're feeling that. And this trend will only continue to go up. And in fact, this past decade has been the warmest on record over the course of more than a century here in San Diego. So clearly, something is happening. So what is it? Let's take a step back and actually think about the chemistry. We hear these terms greenhouse gases, but what do they really do? Greenhouse gases are gases that we have unintentionally, at least in the beginning, put into the atmosphere of our planet, and they're responsible for increasing this global temperature. They're predominantly the three gases that you see here, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrogen dioxide. And the numbers that are next to them show us the percent contribution that we've made to our global atmosphere. So why are these called greenhouse gases? Well, they're responsible for keeping the energy that comes all the way from the sun localized close to the Earth. And the way that happens is, rather than the sunlight actually bouncing off the Earth and going into space, these gases, which are now highly abundant in the Earth's atmosphere, absorb that energy either from the sun or re-radiate re it from the Earth to continue to warm the surface of our planet. And that in turn is causing all of these consequences that we attribute to climate change. And they have a number of sources, some of which might make sense and others might feel a little bit surprising. For example, 30% of our contribution to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere come from the electrical industry. And this seems counterintuitive because electricity is a green energy, but in reality, about a third of all electricity in the continental United States comes from the burning of fossil fuels, and that in turn contributes to climate change. Transportation is a little bit more obvious. You can imagine that the gas that you're burning in your car is pumping out more and more CO2 into the air, and that's how it's, addressed. it's contributing to climate change. Chemical industry does the same thing. These are huge plants that are powered by burning of fossil fuels to make polymers, plastics, uh, metals, virtually anything that you deal with on your day -to -day, uh, in your day-to-day -day lives. Um, residential and commercial burning of gases also contributes to this. So if you have a gas stove at home, you are also contributing a little bit to climate change. And the, lar the smallest fraction of this pie is livestock or the agricultural industry. Um, so you can imagine, say, like a tractor that requires burning of fossil fuels to be able to plant these diverse crops. So all of these, if you add up these numbers, they're virtually 100% of how we are contributing to these greenhouse gases. And if these numbers are not immediately reduced, something that's called a runaway greenhouse effect will happen, which means that the temperature of the planet will continue to increase in a way where we can't go back, right? That should feel very scary. And because this is the only place we know where we can live. Our survival is dependent on addressing this issue. And so we need to not only stop the, the strategies that we're currently using to affect all of these important industries that rely on burning of fossil fuels, but we also need to be able to actively filter that carbon dioxide from air. So just a little bit more uh, technically, this is um, a graph that's showing you the amount of carbon dioxide that is being released globally per year. This is in gigatons, so millions of tons. And you can see that over time, it's still increasing. So this is in the kind of early 2000s to modern day in the 2020s. If we don't affect these issues, if we don't stop our contribution to climate change, 
the amount will continue to increase. If we institute the current policies that are in place, like the development of green energies, that number will stay the same. And that's still actually a problem because the amount of greenhouse gases that are in the Earth's atmosphere will continue to increase the temperature of our planet. And so what we really need to be able to achieve these key values that you may have heard about in the news, like net zero, are technologies that are called negative emission technologies. These are mechanisms that actively find carbon dioxide in air and convert it into something else so that it no longer contributes to climate change and the greenhouse gas effect. So then the question becomes, how do we physically capture carbon dioxide from air? Well, it turns out humanity's actually solved this problem once, and they did it, ironically enough, where there is no air, in space. So on the International Space Station, this is, as you might expect, a huge issue. You have astronauts that we're putting inside this station, and they're going to breathe air. And as we take in oxygen, we excrete carbon dioxide. And if that continues, it eventually becomes toxic. So we need to be able to purify that air very quickly and very actively. And all the different nations that make up the International Space Station have developed slightly different nomenclature for what this machine is called. The US's version is called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Assembly, or the CDRA. And this machine actively takes all the air that exists on the International Space Station, pulls out the carbon dioxide, and puts the remaining air back in. Then it takes that carbon dioxide and actually removes the oxygen, throws away the carbon, puts the oxygen back in the air. So it's an active filtration system that regenerates the oxygen for astronauts in space. So you might think, OK, well, this works pretty well on the International Space Station. We've been running this for nearly two decades. Maybe we can do the same thing on Earth. And this is, in fact, the number one strategy to affect climate change globally today. Now, it's called direct air capture plants here on Earth. You can recognize also that on the previous slide, Commander Swanson was holding the CDRA in his hand. In this image, the human beings, the engineers, are all the way down there. And so it gives you a sense of the complexity of this massive engineering effort because it has to do this on a global scale. And in fact, this strategy does exactly the same thing. These fans pull in air from the atmosphere and they flow it over filters that selectively bind to carbon dioxide. When they do this, the air that's remaining is purified and can be released back into the environment. But that carbon dioxide can be selectively released when you heat the filters and then you can store that carbon dioxide in any which way you want. And in doing so, you're purifying the air in the atmosphere. While this strategy has been somewhat successful, there's a number of huge drawbacks. The first of which you can probably easily glean, it's a monumental effort to put this together. It costs a lot of money, and in fact, it actually costs a lot of energy to build. And it turns out you can only build this in parts of the world that have cheap electricity to run it. So places like Greenland turn out to be a hot spot for DAX. In addition, the filtration mechanism that I described here can only be used a certain number of times. It can only capture carbon dioxide maybe 2,000, 3,000 times, and the whole machine has to be switched. The whole filter system has to be switched. So it's not sustainable. And most importantly, carbon dioxide makes up a lot of stuff. Everything around you is made up of carbon at some level. Wouldn't it be nice if we could use that to do something useful rather than just storing it underground? And so these are kind of the questions that have guided the rest of this presentation. From my perspective, we want to fix this problem, and we want to fix it in a way that addresses all of the issues that are, exist with DAX. Maybe we can build a, a strategy that is cheap, easy to be regenerated, and importantly, converts that carbon into useful molecules. So the question that we asked was, is there precedent in biology to do this? Because biology is generally quite cheap and generally easy to regenerate. If you grow something, it's pretty, um, it can do so pretty quickly. So is there precedent for this? And there is. The atmosphere of our planet is what it is today. These are the values of what we're, the air that we're breathing in right now. It's mostly nitrogen. There's some oxygen, and that's what we're using to survive. And there's a couple other gases after that, including carbon dioxide. But it wasn't always like this. In fact, if we go through the geological record, we find that the concentration of carbon dioxide was a 1,000 times higher than what it was today and oxygen was virtually non-existent. And over that geologic record, this, this billions of years, 
one thing has affected that monumental change, and it's the rise of photosynthesis roughly 3.2 to 3.5 billion years ago. This process, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is where plants or photosynthetic organisms grow by feeding on carbon dioxide from air and building sugars and biomass from those molecules. And in fact, the United States Environmental Protection Agency estimates that of the 100% of the greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere, nearly 11% of that is returned back from the atmosphere through photosynthetic organisms that exist predominantly in our, uh, the forests in the continental United States. So clearly photosynthesis and the act of capturing carbon in a biologically driven way can have an impact. So let's talk a little bit about what is doing that. And it's this really exciting enzyme or protein called Rubisco. Rubisco is actually an acronym that I won't bore you with, but it's a molecular machine, something that a plant makes that actively captures that molecule of carbon dioxide from air. And it does this so effectively that it is the best way to capture carbon dioxide that we have ever found, including DAX. Rubisco is responsible for something like 120 million tons of carbon dioxide captured every single year. And it does this by taking a molecule called RUBP, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a couple of slides, and combining that with carbon dioxide to make this really uh, privileged molecule called 3PG. And 3PG is how the plant goes on then to build all the sugars, all of its leaves, everything. But it's very slow. I'll explain in more detail what that means in a couple of slides, but every molecule of Rubisco can only capture at most 22 molecules of carbon dioxide every second. It also has another side, which is actually quite bad. If we consider this side, the capture of carbon dioxide, to be the ideal properties of Rubisco, Rubisco also sometimes, about a quarter of the time, confuses a molecule of carbon dioxide for a molecule of oxygen. And when it does that, it makes another molecule that looks a lot like 3PG, but instead is called 2PG. And that molecule is very toxic to plants. So it has kind of these two faces, which are probably not ideal from climate change perspective. And as a result, plants have to devote so much energy to balance these negative attributes. In some cases, the entire weight of a single leaf could be 50% just this protein. And that's how the plant is actually able to fix enough carbon dioxide to survive. So this has been kind of a, a really interesting problem for me. As someone that likes to think about biology and chemistry and engineering, I wanted to take a stab at this problem to see whether or not we could make Rubisco better and in turn capitalize on its ability to capture carbon for plant growth and potentially other applications. Now, I want to touch on this last point very briefly, this like burdensome concept, the fact that up to 50% of the weight of the leaf can be Rubisco. Let's do a quick calculation. If we take every molecule of Rubisco on the planet and we weigh it, roughly that will come out to 730 million tons just of this molecule. To put that in perspective, if we take every human being on Earth and we weigh them, it's just a little bit above 50% of that value, okay? So this molecule exists more than there are humans on Earth, but they're not the same. Humans are a lot bigger. And so even though this is about 8 billion people, this is the number of Rubisco molecules that are on the planet. This is 10 to the power of 33, or one with 33 zeros after it. And what it tells you is two things. It's very important, Otherwise, why would biology and nature have chosen it? But also, it's very inefficient. Otherwise, why would it make so much? And this is the problem that we want to address. So how do we actually begin to address this problem? How do we tune, how do we change something in nature? To understand this, we have to understand a key element of how biology conveys information through generations. And it does this through something that's called the central dogma. It's called that because it's so central to how everything in biology happens. The first part of this puzzle is that all the information is encoded in something called DNA. This is the blueprint of all of life. Everything that happens inside of a cell is encoded in this molecule. 
Okay, you can think of this as ones and zeros that the cell somehow knows how to read. Through processes that the cell has evolved over billions of years to really fine tune, it converts that molecule to another messenger molecule called RNA, which in turn is converted to another molecule called a protein. And proteins are the workhorses of the cell. These are the parts of the cell that do all of the chemistry. They move things around, they communicate between cells, they catalyze new reactions. And you can think of these as if DNA is the blueprint to how to build something, a protein is the end product of that blueprint. It's how it's the machine that does the job, in this case, a car. And so I'll carry this analogy throughout so you can appreciate what Rubisco is actually doing. Okay, so let's do a little bit more chemistry. So this is a molecule of Rubisco, and it's a protein that catalyzes a reaction. Synthetic biologists or biologists in general call this an enzyme. The names are interchangeable. And every enzyme has what's called an active site. You can think of, of this as if Rubisco is the car, this is the engine of the car. This is the part that really does the chemistry, has where all the energy is being manipulated in it. And if we zoom in on that, the way Rubisco achieves this heroic feat is it takes these two molecules, first one I told you about a couple of minutes ago called RUBP, which stands for ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. It's a complicated name that basically just means it's a fancy sugar that the plant knows how to make really well. It then combines that with a molecule of carbon dioxide that it finds in the ambient air and takes this sugar and this gas and it forms a bond between those two black circles. Those black circles turn out to be carbon atoms that it's trying to uh, attach to one another. The moment Rubisco does this, something else happens. The bond that I'm showing here becomes incredibly unstable and actually spontaneously breaks on its own. The other thing that's important to note here is that to chemists, something else is happening. If you look at the numbers that I've now put on these black circles, these carbon atoms, this is one, two, three, right? You can imagine a new bond is being built here. And then across the bond that's being broken, there's another three carbon atoms. And it turns out that once the bond that's in the middle breaks, and this happens roughly in about 0.1 seconds, you get two molecules that are identical. And this is kind of just like a quirk of this particular element of biology. And this is that molecule 3PG or 3-phosphoglycerate. And as I told you before, everything in the plant comes from this molecule. It builds its tissue, it builds the leaf, it builds the stalk, it builds all the DNA, it builds all the protein. Everything comes from this. And as a result, this is the step that we want to improve. But I also told you that it's slow. So how slow is it really? Well, I threw up this number before. It can only capture 1 to 22 molecules of carbon dioxide per second. This might seem like a random range, and it kind of is. 22 is the fastest Rubisco we've ever found. Okay? Putting this in perspective, all of us drove to get here today, probably. And so all of the cars that we drove here, when they're going from 1,000 RPM all the way up to, if you're really redlining it, a couple of thousand, maybe 9,000 RPM, the most you're doing is 10 to 70 transformations per second, okay? Rubisco now seems like it's pretty comparable. Your car gets the job done most of the time. And in fact, most enzymes in cells are at about that rate. They're, the average is something like 79 transformations per second. But biology is much better at building these machines than humans are. To give you a sense of what that looks like, we know of enzymes, many, many enzymes, that do 1,000 transformations a second. We know of others that do 100,000. We know of ones that are even well into the millions. And these enzymes are not only feats of biology, they're feats of physics. Because what we also know from the simplest, most idealized calculations we can do, physics prevents these reactions from happening any faster than about 10 million times a second. And so biology and its infinite tinkering can actually develop molecular machines that push the boundaries of physics. So why is Rubisco so bad? And no one knows the answer to this question, but what we're trying to do is to actually make it better. So let's go back to the same car analogy. Imagine you have an active site. Imagine you have something that does chemistry. Well, 
What biology teaches us is that something that does the chemistry can have many different shapes and forms that exist. Sometimes they're really slow, like the rubisco that only does one transformation per second. Sometimes they're faster, like the one that does 22. And what my lab really loves doing is understanding how we get from the slow to the fast, from the bad to the good. How do you define this transition from something that just gets the job done to something that's a lot more special? The central dogma tells us all we have to do is go back all the way to the blueprint and just tweak it, change that design, and in turn, you will change the molecular machine. And so here we want to redesign the blueprint or the DNA. And I should say, despite the number of BMWs on here, this was not funded by BMW. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple of, there's two really important parameters and ideas to understand here. The first is this idea of diversification. So the way to make something better is to change the blueprint. So that means you have to be able to really change that blueprint. So how do you do that? Well, molecular biologists and synthet synthetic biologists are really good at taking one piece of DNA and making lots of little tweaks. And in fact, they can do this in the billions, well into the billions, tens, hundreds of billions of sequences that are all related, but they have differences. You can imagine that the analogy is taking the one blueprint and making billions of different designs on top of that. Maybe going from a four cylinder to a six cylinder, or changing the color or doing something to the car. Some of them will make a faster car. Some of them will not. And the way synthetic biologists like to think about this is exactly the blueprint analogy. We like to call these massive aggregates of modified pieces of DNA a library. And you can probably see the analogy. If every page is a blueprint, then a library has a lot of different books that then have a lot of different blueprints. That's the first part, and we call this diversification, um, as you can see here. The second part is selection. So once you've made all of these different sequences, how do you nominate the faster one, the one that actually does what you want it to do? And so again, going back to the central dogma, we can go from DNA to RNA to protein. In this case, we make the Rubisco enzyme that fixes carbon dioxide. And you can imagine that this is analogous to if you give your blueprints to a factory and they put out a bunch of cars. Okay, great, so we have all of the machines. How do we test them? Well, the analogy here is basically we just have them race. And the one that comes out as the winner, we reiterate this whole process. And this is the framework that has been used now for a few decades to improve on many, many different types of enzymes that exist in nature. And every time, scientists are able to improve something about that enzyme. We have become incredibly adept at taking inspiration from what exists in nature and trying to adjust the way these enzymes do what they do in service of a better world. So a little bit more schematically, we start with all of these DNA, pieces of DNA. They're all a little bit different. We do what's called translation. That means we go through the central dogma and we make the enzymes at the end. We then do the selection. So which one in this case is faster at capturing carbon dioxide and fixing it? And then once we find those quote unquote winners, we make more of that DNA and then we diversify again. This whole process is called directed evolution and its impact on everything was, has been so monumental over just 30 years that it was awarded the 2018 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And my lab really likes directed evolution, but I'm also very impatient. So every one of these cycles, and we can decide how many times we want to go around for every experiment, each one of these cycles can take days to weeks to complete. But I want to go even faster, right? And in, you could imagine maybe nature even goes a little bit faster. And so in my lab, we use different, highly modernized, very high throughput strategies of achieving the same outcome, but we can do this single round in roughly 20 minutes as compared to days and weeks um, using traditional methods. And this is a lot of the work that I worked on uh, while I was at Harvard and the Broad Institute. Okay, so this seems pretty good, but how does it actually compare with nature? So nature, does this all the time. In fact, it just does evolution. So we're doing the laboratory version here. I like to think about this from the perspective of something called the generation time. So for human beings, that's roughly 25 years. So when we have children, how much time does it take for that child to then pass on their genetic information to the next generation? Okay, that's why we call it a generation. 
that number varies for different organisms. And so if we're thinking about evolving rubiscos in plants, we're limited by the generation time of a plant. And so the most common plant in the continental US is this red maple, and its generation time is roughly 10 to 30 years. You can imagine if every one of those generation makes a slightly better rubisco, we're gonna have to wait a long time to make it better. Other plants can grow a lot faster. So crops that have been the product of selective breeding have been chosen because they have a number of desirable attributes like bigger fruit, faster growth rate, and their generation times can be even faster. Model organisms like tobacco or something called thalecress, this is Arabidopsis thaliana, grow considerably faster than that. But even so, it's still quite slow. So the way that we get around this is we use organisms that have a much, much shorter generation time on the order of 10 to 20 minutes, like the common bacterium E. coli. So you may have heard this name before, often in the context of the news where you hear E. coli outbreak. Those are you know, really uh, rough E. coli that have picked up a lot of different tricks from the environment. The ones that we use in the lab are highly um, engineered to not be infectious, they don't have any sort of bad properties, and they really just work, they serve as a workhorse for a lot of the work that we do. But E. coli is not photosynthetic, it doesn't capture carbon dioxide. So the way that we bridge this gap is we go to photosynthetic organisms that have rubisco, we identify it, and through the central dogma we take its DNA that encodes for that sequence, and then we can now put it into our bacterium to study it and to improve it in a radically shortened time frame. And through this capitalization on the very rapid growth rate of E. coli and a lot of modern synthetic biology tricks, we can actually do evolution nearly a million times faster than what nature can do. And you can imagine now this provides access to solutions that maybe nature has never been able to solve, like a faster rubisco. Okay, so I wanna give you a roadmap of what this might look like. So we could go into nature, identify our favorite plant. From there, we can find the gene that encodes for this key carbon capturing enzyme. That, of course, encodes the protein, and we can put that into our engineered E. coli. We can apply the principles of directed evolution to improve its function. And in our system, we've actually engineered these E. coli such that when the rubisco is faster, the bacterium glows and it becomes very easy to identify that it's actually a better rubisco. Then we can go back in the other direction, take the, the DNA that encodes for that improved sequence, put it back into a plant, and that plant is better now at fixing carbon dioxide. So this is the dream. So where are we now? How do we get from point A to point B? So I started my lab at Scripps in August of 2021. Um, a few months later, we established this, uh, an exciting system to really study and evolve this key carbon-fixing enzyme. And within a few months of that, we had already assayed hundreds of different enzymes from across the tree of life, or ones that were completely computationally predictive. They didn't exist in nature. And those enzymes, those sequences, have taught us a lot about what this enzyme is doing and how we could potentially improve it. And in fact, today, some of the directed evolution experiments that continuously optimize these sequences are happening in my lab. Um, where do we go from here? Well, we expect to be validating a lot of these evolved variants within the next few months to maybe a year. And in as short as a couple of years from today, we could be making plants that have enzymes that are much better at capturing carbon dioxide than anything that has ever existed in nature that might seem a little too good to be true. So you might be asking yourself, why hasn't anyone done this before? And if you've been to front row talks before, I think what I'm gonna say next is gonna resonate with you. Scripps has an unprecedented history in the ability to affect change. And in continuing with that tradition, we have developed technologies that provide access now to solutions for this key problem that have never existed before. The first one that I told you about earlier is our ability to evolve proteins very, very quickly in a way that is nearly a million times faster than what exists in nature. And this provides a new framework to actually think about a problem that for billions of years nature has tried to tinker with and solve. Another one that for in the interest of time I haven't had the opportunity to tell you about is the fact that we can change the way that Rubisco gets built. So if you've ever heard the term amino acid, 
all the proteins are built from amino acids. And in fact, it is a very small number of them. It's only around 20 that make up all of the proteins in all of the cells that you've ever seen, including everyone in this room. So different combinations of those 20 sequence, uh, building blocks. My lab has uh, recently developed a strategy, and this is building on really pioneering work by the Scripps president, uh, Peter Schultz, to incorporate new building blocks in proteins in living cells. And now we've developed strategies that provide access to considerably more than those building blocks that are available in nature. And you can imagine now we can build sequences and structures and enzymes that are well beyond the chemical and biological capabilities that exist in nature. Finally, because we're really good synthetic biologists, we've also developed strategies not just to affect, use this strategy to affect climate change. In fact, the 3PG that we created will and can be used to support plant growth to affect this problem. But we can also convert that 3PG into other molecules. We can convert it potentially into molecules like biodegradable plastics or potentially use it for the creation of next generation medicines. And so hopefully, all, these, all three of these technologies, which are now coming to bear on this important problem, will provide foundational solutions in the future. So what happens if we're actually successful? Well, I started by telling you that not only do we need to create strategies to stop the emission of uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases, but we also need to develop these so-called negative emission technologies. And we think that through this process, we'll be able to create organisms, plants, that are the most sustainable strategy to affect climate correction ever seen. And they're sustainable because all they require is a seed. And all you have to do is put that in the ground, give it a little water and sunlight, and now you're contributing to what we're calling climate correction or climate repair. There's more practical elements of this as well. Because Rubisco is the rate determining step in photosynthesis, meaning if you look at all of the different components that have to work well for photosynthesis to happen, Rubisco is by far the slowest. And as a result, modeling and even experimental data should suggest that if you were to improve the way Rubisco does what it does, plants will grow faster. So rather than having to wait three months for a crop, it'll take a month. Not only that, but because it's fixing more carbon, that carbon has to go somewhere and that plant could potentially even make more food. And this is really important considering the fact that because our population is continuing to grow at astronomical rates, we need the ability to be able to produce more food in the future. And we think that this is going to be a huge contributor to that. For kind of more nuanced reasons, it turns out that plants need a lot of water because Rubisco is inefficient. And I'm happy to elaborate on that in the Q&A. And the modeling again suggests that if we make Rubisco better, plants will require less water, which means they will also be drought tolerant. And so there's all of these really exciting attributes that we think kind of come all the way back down to just making Rubisco better. And we're really excited about doing that in the future. So hopefully you've enjoyed this presentation. I'm just gonna kind of summarize the, the bullet points. The first and most important one is that climate change is real and that it's having a disastrous impact on our planet. And that we believe that the key to solving this problem is this enzyme called Rubisco. The key determining step, the key rate determining step in photosynthesis. And that by engineering the chemistry of this enzyme, we believe we'll be able to access improvements that really contribute to climate repair in the near-term future. Um, again, I just wanna echo the points that I started off with. I really appreciate all of you that have joined me today, either in person or on Zoom. I hope that you enjoyed this. Um, I look forward to uh, potential questions that you might have at the end. But importantly, I want to highlight the people that did the work. And the ideas and the, the data that we have and the really exciting directions we're taking is the product of a number of heroic and, and very passionate individuals that you see here on the slide. Um, so I'm grateful to them and all the work that they've done. Of course, I am in incredibly indebted to the funding agencies that have supported this and other work in our lab. And if this idea of using chemistry, engineering, and biology to affect sustainable change is interesting to you, I encourage you to check out our lab website where we're doing a lot of other work on Rubisco as well as plastics and antibiotics um, even today. So with that, thank you again and uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A.
one of the things that, that really struck me, there, well, there's two things that just struck me. I'll just make a comment. And so one is that um, Rubisco is the most abundant enzyme on the planet because it's the worst. Yeah. And the other thing is, I'm, so photosynthesis came around, you said, like three billion years ago. And so it must be the case that every carbon atom in our bodies that at one time went through a Rubisco. That's exactly right. So the, the modeling that we have, and in fact, a lot of the data that we have also says exactly that. Every molecule of carbon in every person in this room came through this enzyme. Problem is, because it's so slow, it took a really long time right, to right. do that. Um, Great. OK, so uh, do we, we have a question down here. Oh, Hi, thank good. you yeah. for your presentation. You did an excellent job. Thank you. Um, my question is regarding policy. Um, I'm curious if Scripps or the state of California, um, I, I recently heard in the news that a lot of oil um, companies are taking interest in this kind of research mm -hmm. in order to increase their output. So what kind of thought process is going behind that on your end? Are you involved at all with decision-making policy-wise? Uh, I have not been involved in it yet. I imagine as we get closer and closer to the finish line that that is something that will happen. Um, from the perspective of reaching that goal, a lot of the biology infrastructure and policy has already been defined. So for example, how do you go about modifying plants and how do you categorize them? Are they GMOs? Are they not GMOs? And fortunately, because of how we're approaching this problem, a lot of what we're doing actually will not be categorized as GMOs. And so we expect to be able to easily fit into existing policies and importantly, actually capitalize on people that would want to work with some of the engineered plants that we would make. Um, from the perspective of oil companies, I can't speak to it. I mean, I think uh, they clearly have an invested interest in correcting the damage. Um, maybe what they do changes over time, but I think for now we're all taking the right first steps. And so hopefully in the future, we'll kind of continue along this path. Uh, I, I'm gonna take a question from the, the Zoom audience. I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, uh, but so when you're evolving uh, Rubisco in E. coli, so E. coli normally doesn't grow on CO2. So is that in fact how you do the selection is that they have no way to, to fix carbon other than, than making 3PG? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's actually a little bit more nuanced than that. So we like to do these experiments in a way where they're very quantitative. And so what we've done is engineer these bacteria so that they don't actually put that carbon into something that they use to grow. We provide other sources for them to use to grow. And what we do instead is we create sensors in the cell that count the number of carbon dioxide atoms or sorry, molecules, that get captured by our system. We can then funnel that, meaning we can convert the product, 3PG, into other molecules that we think are interesting. And so those could be ones that have kind of practical outcomes. Um, this is more of a intermediate step. We do this just to be able to monitor and evolve these enzymes in the lab. When we're done with these evolutions, then those enzymes go back into the plant, and there they make 3PG that then contributes to the building of the biomass. So it's, yep. we're really just capitalizing on a lot of the tools of synthetic biology um, to do this. Uh, do we, any other questions here in the audience? I'm sure I can't you wave your hand. Oh, there we go. Hello. Um, I'm wondering, you know, when we have identified uh, uh, a Rubisco version that we want to deploy. Do you have an idea of how much plant mass with this new Rubisco will need to make a significant impact on the carbon levels? Uh, maybe also, you know, do you have an idea of what the process would be like to deploy this out? You know, just, I don't know, high level logistics or approximate timelines? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, 
So I, I recently did a back of the envelope calculation to try and figure out whether or not we could affect real change. Um, before I tell you about that calculation, I want to put something in perspective. The field of directed evolution has existed for roughly 30 years. And everything that we have put into this box of directed evolution not only has generated something that's better, but it's been better by orders of magnitude. Right? So it is not uncommon to say, take something that exists in nature and make it 10,000, 100,000 times better at that reaction or some other reaction. For Rubisco to be impactful, the current uh, trajectory that many organizations want to achieve is the capture of five, er, 500 gigatons, 500 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. The goal that has been kind of placed on the horizon is to do so by 2050. That seems like a, it's a big number, but I actually don't think it is. So if you look at existing agricultural industries, let's just look at US corn. For us to achieve that number today, okay, we have to take the corn rubisco and make it four times better, and then convince the US agricultural industry to use that corn versus normal corn or whatever corn they might be using. And I think even that is not impractical for two reasons. The first is it actually wouldn't be classified as a GMO because we're not introducing any foreign information. We're just tweaking the information that exists naturally in that plant. And the other is that farmer is probably going to benefit from it because if the data that we have is correct, the plant will grow faster and it will make more fruit or food, whatever it might be, in this case, corn. So all the signs point to not only is the change possible, but the change is possible in a very meaningful time frame. Thank you. Any other questions here from the audience? Yeah. Let me see. Oh, there's one down here. Yeah. Oh. Good. Um, thank you for the talk also. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, um, if I understood it, additional building blocks, additional amino acids introduced. Um, are you able to encode that in DNA? that aren't used naturally? Yes, so this is actually building on foundational technology that Peter Schultz developed um, roughly 30 years ago. And the approach that he took kind of goes all the way to the beginning of the central dogma. It recognizes that every piece of DNA has a meaning. And the way that that information is conveyed from DNA all the way to protein is in sets of three. So you have the, the normal bases, A, T, C, and G, and they come in sequences of three bases at a time. And those bases mean one amino acid. So you can have A, T, G, for example, means an amino acid called methionine. And through the central dogma, that ends up getting conveyed. And what Pete dis, uh, recognized is that at some level, that code can be tweaked, and you can reassign what it means. And so in his early systems, what he showed is that you could actually create new sequences or use existing sequences to then denote new amino acids, new building blocks that you add to growing cells. We've now built on this foundational work to define improved strategies of encoding that information so that we can put in not only amino acids more efficiently, but we can do so in what's called a multiplex sense. So we can put in many different amino acids all within the same protein, and we can do so very, so very efficiently. So, um, Ahmed, one thing that I was reflecting on during your talk was that, you know, we know a lot about rubisco sequences. So every plant has a rubisco, and we've got, you know, algae, we've got sequoias, you've got everything in between. And so there's this whole family tree of rubiscos. And so what can you learn about that, about how rubisco did evolve? What did the ancestral ones look like? And then maybe what, you know, what are the bottlenecks for, for I mean, clearly evolution itself hasn't mm -hmm. done a, gotten out of this rut. Yeah. So what, what's the bottleneck? And, and, and I'm sure you've stared at a lot of rubisco yeah. sequences. So it's a great question. And it has a kind of a two-part answer. The first is that the way we think about the evolution of DNA through time has really improved in recent decades. And in fact, by looking at a number of different sequences, we can predict 
what a so-called ancestral sequence may have looked like. We expect that ancestral sequences embody characteristics uh, that exist across multiple different sequences today, and so we can work our way backwards to kind of that universal ancestor. From a protein engineering standpoint, this actually ends up teaching us a lot. Many of the proteins that we create using this process can have improved properties. They can be more thermostable. They can have higher activities or different spectrum of substrates. And in Rubisco, we've actually started to apply this now. And we've learned a lot about how Rubisco evolved, how it interacts both with, it, with itself or other components of that machinery, and how we might be able to engineer it to do its job better in the future. So that was kind of the first part to your question. Um, the other part is that Rubiscos across the tree of life have evolved slightly differently. So in plants, the plant decided at some point that it's going to make a lot of Rubisco. So that's where the 50% comes from. But like Jamie said, there are other organisms like cyanobacteria, for example, that are known to be photosynthetic. And in fact, they also encode a Rubisco. But they don't make nearly as much Rubisco, and they solve this problem in a different way. They build compartments where they put the Rubisco in and then pump in carbon dioxide to make the reaction more effective. And so the tree of life turns out to have many of these kind of secondary solutions on top of Rubisco that improve its efficiency. But we think that these kind of bottom line issues with Rubisco still exist across every element of the tree of life. So that something you said made me uh, come up with another question. So the, the temperature dependence. So you're e evolving E. coli, you're growing it at 37. But so first of all, what's the normal temperature dependence for the enzyme? So if, you, if it's cold, does it work slower than if it's warm? And then there has to be, an, you know, if you're in full sunlight in a warm climate, the leaf temperature has to be yeah, you know, higher than 37 degrees. So, so what, what's, what's the parameters and can you actually engineer things yeah. that have properties outside the E. coli uh, phase? Yeah, so I guess the first point is that life exists basically in every corner of our planet. Mm -hmm. And this extends even to Rubisco. So there are versions of this enzyme that exist in plants that live in very temperate conditions. Same thing goes for very warm conditions. And there are even rubiscos that come from microorganisms that exist in some of the hotter parts of our planet. And all of those are a little bit different, and all of them work in slightly different temperatures. And so you can imagine that, you know, maybe the rubisco from a tree that doesn't do so well in cold and warm weather probably doesn't want to work at 37. Um, so this is something that we've also seen in the lab, and we have some molecular tricks of trying to help those proteins along. One way that we achieve this is we make other proteins that help those temperature, you know, poorly folded proteins fold better. Um, these proteins are called chaperones, quite appropriately, because they chaperone that rubisco to fold better and have a better activity. Um, but your point on how that relates to the climate is actually quite pertinent, because it turns out that the vast majority of rubiscos are in this very temperate regime, that they don't want to work in warmer temperatures. And even though Rubisco could potentially address climate change by capturing carbon dioxide as it continues to accumulate in the atmosphere, the increasing temperature of the planet actually means that Rubisco will work increasingly poorly as that Earth warms up. And so it's actually very sensitive to these temperatures, and one of the things we're working on is to also improve that stability so even in the face of climate change, that these enzymes are more robust. OK, listen, we're coming up on the hour. So I think I'm going to draw to a close. Those of you here in the audience can engage Ahmed out on the patio. We have a little reception here. Uh, I did want to just uh, call to your attention that um, the next uh, front row in uh, October is Ali Torkamani, and he's uh, a member of the Scripps Research Translational Institute, and he'll be telling us about digital medicine and I think uh, cardiology studies. So a, a pretty different topic, but a pretty interesting uh, next lecture. So I encourage you to, to tune in for that. So uh, all that remains me to do is just to say, hey, we've got a big problem here that, that's been identified. Uh, it's an incredibly difficult task to solve. The good news is we have a smart guy. <laughs> Thank you.